All right. Well, we appreciate everyone coming out tonight. We uh, hope you came of your own volition. Uh, we know sometimes our people tend to get aggressive and try to drag you in here, but it's just because we love you and care for you. And so we hope that you are heal, here healthy. If not, we hope that and believe that you will leave healthy. Amen? That's why you're here. So we, we fully know and believe and have experienced the power of God, and we expect there to be no difference here in Perth tonight as it has been in any other place we've ever been. Amen? God is the same. Jesus is the same. And usually we're the only variable. So if we can just be the same, everything works the same. Amen? Now, so first off, let's just go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you. Lord, we give you praise and glory and honor for everything that's going to take place here tonight. We thank you that you are always the same. We thank you that you are faithful that to what you have promised, you do. Father, we thank you that what we're going to share tonight is how much you've already done. And Father, we just give you praise and glory for it. And we just say, have fun tonight, Lord, and show off in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, a couple of things that we do want to, to go ahead and get into. I want to get to the Word as quickly as we can. And not going to share a whole lot, not going to talk a whole lot. We want to get to ministry uh, to those that are sick. We don't want to keep you waiting long. Uh, if we get a chance, I may give some testimonies. I may not. It's, it's not necessary for me to give testimonies for there to be testimonies. Uh, but a lot of times we start talking about them and then they just kind of start flowing out, this one and that one. But I do want to go ahead and get some word into you. And I just want to show you the legal basis of why we do what we do and why God does what he does and, and why he's, as I should say, has already done it. And so... If you will, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn first to Isaiah chapter 53. And we're going to take you and show you what it actually means to say that Jesus has paid the price. Now, there's a lot of things. If, if I did just give testimonies tonight, we could just go on and on with testimonies because God has just been so awesome and just to meet people where they are. Uh, we were talking today about how God has made provision for people to be healed regardless of their spiritual development. You know, you don't have to be super spiritual to get healed. Amen? You, you can be completely unspiritual and get healed. Uh, you can be a new Christian, a baby Christian, a mature Christian. You can be... I've seen God heal pretty much everybody and everything. Right? Right? We've watched him do some amazing things. And it just never ceases to amaze me of how he does things. And we've, again, I, I'm not going to, I'm real tempted to just go into tem to, uh, testimonies and stuff, but I'm telling you, if we do, we won't get in the word at all because we just, you know, one leads to the next and that reminds me of this one and we just go on. But I will tell you this, we've seen every part of the human body healed. We've seen every disease healed that we have encountered healed. Now, that, that doesn't mean we've seen everyone healed individually right then, but I don't know of a disease we've ever encountered that we haven't seen healed at some point or other. I mean, it's just amazing. But the reason being is because, and, and I want to emphasize this, tonight I'm going to be ministering to you, but I'm not going to be the only one. We're going to, we've got several people, many people here that have been trained. And what I mean by that is they understand what the Word of God says about healing, they believe the Word of God about healing, and they're willing to minister healing to you and to help you get well. And so we're going to give them an opportunity to help me in this just because of the numbers. I don't want you to have to sit and wait forever and wait for me to get to you. And, you know, there's nothing special about me. Uh, I don't claim any gifts. I don't claim any special power or anything like that. I'm just a Christian with the Spirit of God. And any Christian with the Spirit of God can do what I do. Amen? And so this isn't about Curry Blake. This isn't about, you know, any man's name. It's just Jesus. It's about Jesus. And if you'll, if you'll just look to him at this point, what I mean by that is if you will focus on the fact of what he has done, then it makes things a lot easier. All right? Now, you can say, well, I don't believe any of this. Well, you'll probably be the first one to get healed. 
That God is just that way, you know. Like I said, we just pray God show off, and He likes to. And so, a lot of times when people says, you know, show me, that's the first thing He does. And so, we just want to. Uh, as a matter of fact, I will even tell you this: this whole service. Now, you know, when we think of a healing service, we think of pre- usually we think of worship, preaching, healing, you know, prayer for the the sick, and that kind of thing. Well, you can already tell we're not doing worship. Right, because this isn't about getting you worked up. Not that all worship is that. I'm just saying we go the other way and try to play things down. Because you're not gonna, the people we've been training this week are not gonna have all that excitement on the street, which is where we're training them to minister to people, not in church. Right? We're not training church people to operate this way. We're t- we're training believers to operate on the street and take healing to the masses. Now, obviously, uh, when you go on the street and you're ministering to people like that, then obviously money has nothing to do with it, right? And so, just like that, tonight, we're not taking up an offering. Everything's already been paid for. Everything's been taken care of, and it was paid for by Jesus. Amen? So, there's not going to be any talk about money. We're not doing anything with money. We are here to bless you and to help you, and that's, you know, technically the training's done. So, I mean, technically, we could have finished up today and just said, okay, the training's done, so, you know, I'm going back to my motel room and get ready to leave tomorrow. But we knew that there are sick people in the town, and so we want to minister to you and help you. And so the training now goes from just the training part. You know, so far it's been teaching, now it comes to training. Amen? So those of you who've been in the classes this week, you're going to get a chance to minister, but mainly the ones that have been through the DHT before, if you know what I mean by that. The DHT is just our divine healing training, right? Now, hopefully you found Isaiah 53. Now, if you don't have a Bible, you can look on with somebody. It's, I'm going to read it to you anyway, so you really don't even have to read it, but it's always good if you can tell that what I'm reading is exactly what the Bible says. So, Isaiah 53. First off, verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, one of those, these are two questions, and one question answers the other question. Who has believed our report? That's the answer to the next question. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Well, the arm of the Lord always refers to the power of God. And the arm of the Lord is revealed to whoever believes their report. Now, you notice it says, who has believed our report, not other reports. Undoubtedly, many of you in here have received reports from other people, reports that weren't good, reports that said that there's not a lot of hope for you or your situation is pretty serious. But I'm here to tell you, I've got a better report for you. Amen? Amen? You say, yeah, but that's just an old book. And it's been around you know, thousands of years. And what makes you think that, that that report has anything to do with me? Well, that's the beauty of this old book. It's proven the test of time. It's been around for thousands of years in the same scripture that has been applied to other people in different situations, has worked for them, and that same scripture will work for you. And mainly, the good thing about it is we're going to apply it to you. Right? That way you don't have to apply it to yourself. Now, while I'm preaching, you know, if you preach healing, you get healing. And so, while I, now, I'm not necessarily preaching healing. What I'm preaching, technically, you may hear healing in it, but technically what I'm preaching is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Right? And I'm going to show you the benefits of His death, burial, and resurrection of his crucifixion, of his being whipped. And because of what he went through, you don't have to go through what you've been going through. He bore it for you. And tonight, we're going to get it switched off of you and onto him. Amen? Now, so at any time, now, you can wait till we lay hands on you. You can do that. It's not a problem. We're going to lay hands on everybody. Anybody that wants hands laid on them and wants ministry, you're going to have hands laid on you. Nobody has to leave here without getting ministered to. At the same time, I would also tell you, you don't have to wait till we get to you. 
if you at any point you just decide to believe, you can do it. Now, if you wait till we get to you, you don't even have to believe. We'll believe for you. But if you want to believe, we won't stop you. All right? And you can just decide to believe. And at the moment you believe, as soon as you believe, whatever problem you got, you can just get up and walk away from it. Because that's all it takes. And whenever we get to you, all we're going to do is believe. Amen? Nothing fancy. Just believe. See, that's why most people miss it. Because it's so simple that people think that they have to do something special. But there was a Syrian one time named Naaman. The prophet went to him, or actually he went to him. There was a little servant girl who said, you need to go over to the prophet. If you go over there, he'll, he will heal you of your leprosy. And so he went over to visit the prophet. And the prophet didn't even come out to see him. He sent his servant out and said, go, go dip seven times in the Jordan River and you'll be healed. And the man got mad, rode off with all of his company and all of his troops. He was a Syrian general. And he said, well, he didn't even come out and do anything. And one of the people said, you know, his, his, well, if he'd have come out and waved his hand and said something fancy, you'd have believed him. So why don't you just go do what he said to do and dip seven times in the Jordan River? So finally when he did, he got healed. Now, the old prophet didn't do anything special. Just said, go do this. Well, <clears throat> I wasn't going to do this, but here I go with the testimony. <laughs> Reminds me of a time. I... Um, when we first started ministering to the sick, <clears throat> I started studying healing. There was a reason for it. My daughter was born with a tumor, and so I needed healing for my daughter. And <clears throat> when we started learning some truth about healing and started applying it, it started working. Well, one of the first people to come to us for ministry was a young man that he was way taller than me, which still doesn't mean he was that tall, but he was taller than me, and he was pretty thin, and he was real gray. His skin was gray colored. And when he got to me, he actually worked at a movie theater, at least part-time where he had before that, and he actually made his living at this point playing pool, right? Shooting pool, gambling on pool games. And so, you know, he wasn't living what people would think is a, the best Christian life and all that kind of stuff. And he came to me, and actually somebody else brought him and told me about the case and he said, while he was working at the movie theater, somebody played a trick on him. And actually, I don't know where they got it, but he said that they actually dumped mercury in his drink. And he didn't know it. And he, when he drank it down, he felt it, you know, because he didn't see it. It was in a cup. And he didn't see it, but he drank it, and he could feel it when it went down, but he didn't know what it was. Well, soon after that, he started getting sick, couldn't keep food down, started losing weight having all kinds of internal problems and different things. Skin started turning gray. And literally, it looked, he looked like a person that had HIV and was just wasting away. Doctors tried to get it out of him. They couldn't get it out of him. And, and really, they could not help him. And he was just getting worse and worse and worse. And he was, you know, like I said, especially tall. And so he kept losing weight. And it was pretty obvious when you're that tall, when you lose weight, it shows up really bad. Well, he came to us, and I'll never forget, because the man that brought him to us, we'd been praying for people and heard some of the testimonies, so he stood in there in front of me, and we started to pray, and so I just reached out, and at that time, just touched him, and nothing happened. I didn't feel, I, well, actually, I felt what I would call power going into him, but he was just standing there. I mean, no response, and I'm thinking, how is he standing up? I'm almost ready to fall down. How is he? He should be falling. Or not that you have to fall, but I'm saying when you can feel it like that, you think there's going to be some response. And so the guy that brought him to, to see me was standing behind him. And so I was laying hands on him and I could feel the power, which, and again, I don't always feel stuff and I'm, I don't go by feeling. I go by the word of God. But I, I could feel this. And so finally I looked around him and the guy behind him, the one that brought him to see me, was standing behind him, had his hand in his back. And he was standing there going, 
I mean, he was almost falling down. And he had his hand on the guy's back, and the guy that I was laying hands on was just standing there. I mean, and that was the first time whenever I saw that, the first thing I said was, I said, well, get, get your hand off of him. Don't touch him. So I'm really kind of picky about it. If I'm touching, you know, laying hands on somebody, I prefer if other people don't do it. Because I remembered reading about a, another man that was a well-known healing minister at that time, or actually way many years before, that he had... He, he likened the power of God to electricity. And he said the power of God is, is transmitted the same way that electricity is transmitted. And I remember that because that's exactly the way tra- electricity does. And so I started realizing that according to the Bible and what we can see, that the power of God, can, there can be a tangibility about it. And so I, I ministered to him and when I took the guy's hand off and laid hands on him, then he felt something. Well, then, a short time after that, he came back, was completely healed. Completely healed. Then he started telling people about it, people that knew him, in the nightclubs where he was playing pool. And it'd be 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. We'd be at home on a Friday and Saturday night. He'd be knocking on the door. I opened the door and he'd be standing there in his nightclub clothes and he'd have one or two people with him. He'd say, I was playing pool and uh, this person here, she has cancer and and this person here, they had uh, this situation and he would just, he would leave the nightclub, bring them to my house. They'd step inside. We'd pray for them. They'd get healed. Sometimes you could see it. Sometimes you couldn't right away just depending on what the thing was and then they would leave and he'd go back and finish his pool game. Now, the thing is, he was gambling for a living, and yet God healed him. And, and he kept gambling, and God didn't take it away from him. That shocked me, to be honest with you, at the time especially. And so, he kept coming around, and he kept bringing more people out. Well, then, he would bring different people at different times, but finally, one time we were ministering to a young girl that had cancer, and she'd been operated on eight or ten times for cancer, and every time they thought they got it, but then they didn't, and it would show up somewhere else later on, and <clears throat> he brought her out, and we ministered to her, she's 21 years old, had a two-year-old baby boy that she had never been able to pick up, never been able to lift because of the cancer in her body, had weakened her bones so much that anytime she tried to pick him up, one time he kicked her in the ribs and broke her ribs. One time she tried to pick him up and actually fractured her arm trying to pick him up. That's how weak the bones were. We, we stood there. We ministered to her. She left. We, she went to the doctor the next Monday. And the doctor said, we can't find any cancer in you. And she was completely healed and was able to pick up her baby. And so I could go on and on with these stories. But I want to go back to the man that brought her there, the man that had the mercury poisoning. He was completely healed. And then one night we were standing there, the night we ministered to that girl. He said, you know, I'm healed. Everything's good. He said, but I still can't really digest food well. And he said, there are certain foods I just can't eat. So I just looked at him. I said, well, if you could eat anything that you wanted right now, what would it be? And he said, it would be a vanilla milkshake. And I thought, you need higher standards. You know, (laughs) If, if you could eat anything... You should get something better than that. <clears throat> and, and, but when he said that, I looked at him and said, well, go drink one. Didn't pray. Nothing fancy. No hoopla. Just said, go drink one. He looked at me and said, bye. He was gone. I saw him about a week later, and he was coming out of a Mexican restaurant with a toothpick in his mouth. He gained about five, I think five or seven pounds within a week. I mean, and he had went and drank a vanilla milkshake and then was eating everything he wanted. And from that day on, he was completely healed. Now, again, I could go on and on and on. The funny thing was, later on, I was down in Florida and there was a man that brought his daughter in and we were having a, and it was a meeting in a house. And we had about 25, 30 people there. And I taught for a good while. 
And then they had a, um, she, the little girl had a food allergy for seafood. Couldn't eat seafood. So when we finished ministering that night, teaching the word, then she asked me to pray for her for her food allergy. And I said, well, because I remember this guy, and I didn't even pray for her. I said, well, what is it you can't eat? And she said, well, seafood. And I said, well, go eat it. Well, she was eight years old. And the father said, well, because it's about 1130 at night. He said, where are we going to go find seafood this late at night? And the woman that owned the house that we were in, she said, well, I've got some frozen shrimp in the refrigerator. And so they thawed out the shrimp and cooked it. And they said, well, good, we'll cook it and we'll do it now because you're here. <laughs> and they said, we don't want to take any chances. <laughs> so I said, okay, so we hung out a bit and talked. And they got the shrimp ready. She ate it. An hour later, no change. I, now it's about 1, 1.30 in the morning by now. People are starting to go home. Little girl's completely healed. I didn't pray. And later on, I went up to Valparaiso, Indiana in a big uh, National Guard armory. The building was probably about this size, maybe even further back that way, kind of going back. <clears throat> had a platform like this. Had several hundred people there, close to a thousand actually. And... It was funny because we were just about, I'd been ministering that morning, we are just about to break for lunch. And I said, okay, well, we're going to break for lunch. I said, now look, uh, somebody said, had asked me, said, uh, before we go to lunch, can you pray for me? And I said, well, what for? And they said, well, I have food allergies. And I said, oh, wait a minute, before everybody goes, let me tell you a story. And I told her, I told them the story about the man that had the mercury poisoning. I told them the story about the young girl that was healed. And I said, look, how many of you have food Allergies. And the hands of about probably, oh, had to be close to 50 or 60. Hands went up. And I said, okay, look, if you come to me and ask me for prayer, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to pray. I'm going to say, go eat it. So I'm telling you right now, go eat it. Well, now that makes no sense, right? But they went out. When we come back, the first thing we did was have a testimony service because everybody coming back in said, I got to eat food I haven't eaten in 10 years. I got to eat food I hadn't eaten in 20 years. I ate this food. I ate that food. I ate these different things. See, it was amazing. We had probably, I want to say probably close to 40 or 45 cases where they just lined up and testified that they were healed. I mean, I didn't pray for any of them. Just told them, go do what you couldn't do. And so, I was just trying to, to get them to realize that it's not about Curry Blake, it's not about my hands, it's not about a gift, it's about Jesus. He is right there. It's not about you looking at me necessarily. It's not about you looking up here. Jesus is right there with you. Amen? Now, again, we could go on and on with different testimonies. and you know, I, I enjoy the testimonies because every time I talk about them, I relive them. And I, I remember the different situations and different people that's going on. And, and, and if you could just realize I am absolutely so normal that I'm just like you, that whenever I see these things take place, I'm as amazed as you are. I mean, I'm not surprised anymore, but I'm still amazed. Why? Because God is so good. We've not found anything he didn't want to heal. We didn't find any, anybody he's turned away. It's just amazing how simple it is. And so that's what I'm telling you. So even now, while I'm speaking, at any point that you feel a change going on in your body, just begin to do what you couldn't do before. And if you see that it's gone, then just maybe wave at us or let us know something's happened in your body. We did this, um, well, actually we've done this a couple times since we've been here, but last Sunday we were in a church in Melbourne, or outside Melbourne, and we went, ministering to people, and then the pastor got up and said, how many have already felt the change in your body? And hands went up all over the building. God had already touched them. God had already set them free. And so all I'm trying to say is I really want you to move beyond the idea of coming to see a you know, healing evangelist or a faith healer. Okay? Now, if your faith needs healing, I will pray for it. All right? But I'm not a faith healer. You understand? I believe in divine healing. I believe that Jesus heals. I believe that uh, when we say divine healing, I'm talking about God's power touching you, fixing, changing. But it's not this hoopla. It's not this 
wildness and the, the, you know, the, the stuff that you see on television, right? It's, it should be real simple. And if it's God, then we shouldn't have to work anybody up. Amen? If I have to work you up to get you healed, then it's probably not spiritual. It's probably psychological. And you'll get feeling good, and then after you leave, it'll come back on you because it never really left. You just got some excitement. So I don't do that. I don't work you up, don't get you all you know, excited and all that kind of stuff. I just try to share the fact that God loves you. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much, he died for you. He died for your sins, but before he died for your sins, he was also whipped and beaten. And the only reason he was whipped and beaten was so that by his stripes, by his whipping, you were healed. So he took care of your physical and your spiritual. You know, I've had people, well, we'll be looking at the scripture in just a minute, but I want, I want to get to this to you. We're going to look at about three scriptures. We're going to look at Isaiah 53. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 8. We're going to look at 1 Peter 2, 24. Real simple scriptures, right? Now, the first one I just told you, <clears throat> verse 1, Who hath believed in our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, I'm not going to read all of this, because you can read it, and most of you might not even really care, you know, what it says anyway. But I'm just trying to give some of you a good basis. If you look at verse 4, it says, Surely he hath, past tense, borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now that sounds like grief, and it sounds like emotional things, and sorrows sounds like emotions. But it's not just referring to that. Actually, the word griefs and sorrows here means, in the original Hebrew, sicknesses and diseases. So really what it says is, surely he has borne our infirmities, our sicknesses, and carried our diseases. Now, one of the, what I'm going to emphasize here tonight is that if you believe that Jesus bore your sins, you can't believe just that he bore your sins. If you're going to believe that he bore your sins, you also have to believe that he bore your sicknesses and diseases. It either, listen, it either stands or falls together. It's no ifs or ands or buts about it. It's either yes or no. It's either everything or nothing. The reason it says that is this. And again, I don't expect you to know all this, but it's something that you can remember. You don't, I, I'm trying to just tie it up for you. There's two words here where it said born and carried, Right? It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Well, those are two different English words. And if you look at the Hebrew, it's two different Hebrew words. But it's two Hebrew words. One is nasal and the other is sabal. And it, they, but the thing about them is that they are actually a synonym or synonyms, which is two different words that mean the same thing. So when you use the word nasal and sabal, those are interchangeable, but they mean exactly the same thing. Now, the definition of that word, of both words actually, is this. To carry or to bear as a punishment for another so that that one doesn't have to bear it themselves. Now, we know that's what Jesus did with our sins, isn't that right? We know that he bore our sins as a punishment so that we don't have to bear them. Now, I don't think anybody would say that we have to continue bearing our sins for any reason, certainly not to keep us humble, certainly not to show anything. I mean, there's nothing good can come out of you bearing your own sins. Jesus bore our sins. He carried our sins for us so that we no longer have to. Is that right? You believe that? All right. <clears throat> now, if you believe that, you also have to believe that he bore and carried your sicknesses and diseases as a punishment so that you no longer have to. Why? Because the same words are used in verse 4 that are used down in verse 11 and 12. If you look at verse 11 and 12, it says, He shall see... The travail of his soul shall be satisfied, and by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear, Sabal, their iniquities. 
So he bore your iniquities for you. And he, if you look up in verse 4, he carried or suballed your sorrows, which is diseases. Now, I'm trying to keep this very simple. And the beauty of this is, listen, you don't have to understand this for it to work for you. I really don't understand how electricity works. But I can flip on a switch. Right? Just flip the switch. So you don't have to know how it works. You just got to know how to flip on the switch. Well, we know how to flip on the switch. Now, you don't have to know. But as long as somebody knows. See, somebody here, I don't even know where the switches are in this room. But thank God somebody knew where they were. Or we'd all be sitting in the dark. Right? But since somebody knew, and I even I don't even know who knew, but somebody knew, and because they knew, we all get the benefit of their knowledge. Isn't that right? Well, it's about the same thing. You don't have to know how healing works. Technically, we don't even have to know how healing works. But the beauty of it is, if we can flip on the switch, we can bask in the benefit of somebody's knowledge about it because at least they have enough knowledge to flip on a switch. Amen? Now this stuff is, like I said, it's real simple. And I don't care what your problem is. I don't care what your disease is. I don't care how long you've had it. None of that matters because I'm not focusing on your disease. Because I don't care how big your disease is. I don't care how terrible and horrible it is. Now what I mean by I don't care, obviously I care about you, but what I mean is I'm not focusing on that. I'm not a doctor, so I'm not focusing on the disease. I'm a preacher, so I'm focusing on the cure. Amen? And the cure is Jesus. He bore it. And as long as I focus on him and what he did, and I look at your problem through his eyes, your problem doesn't seem near as big. Because if you think about it, how big a problem is your problem to God? Do you think it'd be really big? You think God would look at your problem and go, I don't know about that one. That's pretty tough. I'll have to really work up some umption there, you know, to get in there and really put. You think he'd do it? I don't think he'd do that. I think God could pretty much look at any situation and go, that's not too big. I think I can handle that. Amen? And so our job is just to look at your problem through God's eyes. And as long as we look at it through God's eyes, we don't get scared. Now, if I had to look at it through my eyes, a human's eyes, I might get a little intimidated, right? But I've learned not to do that. I've learned now when I walk up to a hospital room door to stop and just take a second and say, you know, Father, I don't know what's on the other side of this door, but I do know that whatever it is, me and you can beat it because I've been in some rooms that's bad. I've been in places you wouldn't believe. I put my hands on people and on diseases and things like that. That actually my my family has uh, (laughs) flinched at at times. And my mother-in-law, one time, the first time I went to Africa, the first thing she said was, you're going to go over there and catch something, bring it back and kill us all. (laughs) She didn't quite have the understanding down yet. But I told her, I said, no, no, I'm not going over there to catch something. I'm going over there to kill something. (laughs) And so I've gone all over the world. I've touched every type of disease. I've put my hand in the middle of goo that was supposed to be contagious. And I've never caught anything from anybody. We've we've come back. It's it's been amazing. I could... I, if you could, you know, sometimes, I, and we talked about this in Melbourne, I wish sooner or later they're going to come up with a machine that they can plug in your brain and show on a screen what you're thinking. And if they ever do that, you're going to be in for a treat. Because I've seen some things. And I've seen God do some amazing things. And there is no way I can describe it, but I sure wish you could have seen them. And some of, the, some of the best things I've seen was obviously not the problems, but it was the, the results and the people afterwards. Whenever you can take a baby and hand it back to his mother and say, it's going to be okay now. 
And we were in Indonesia. Oh, man. It was amazing. Actually, you can, if you go, ever go to our website, it's uh, jglim.org. If you go there and look at it and scroll down on the, there's a page that says videos or media, something like that, and you scroll down the bottom, it'll show a video at the very bottom of the page, and it's our trip to Indonesia. And it's all the footage from the trip when we went into in- Indonesia. It was amazing. We were in an area. Oh, I almost said the name. I can't, I c- couldn't remember the name of it. But it was basically a Muslim area, and they actually had that, which is normal for them. They hired armed guards because the Christians coming in, a lot of times the militant uh, Islamists would try to come in and break up the meetings. And so they had to bring us into the compound, basically, and have services. And there was everybody else that had been in there. They had broke up the meetings. And so when we got there, they said, don't be surprised if we have to stop the meeting and take you out the back because there will be a threat going on and all that stuff. And so finally, <clears throat> the night we started teaching, and we started teaching people how to minister healing and why God wants to heal. heal. And they started going out and doing it. And they started getting people healed. Well, that stirred up some of the militant Islamists there. But the amazing thing was the night of the healing service. So many people had already been healed that they started bringing in the people and the Muslims started bringing in their people because they'd been hearing about the healings that had taken place. And it was... If you ever seen the movie Jesus of Nazareth and you see when he's on the side of the hill and people are going up and they're in different states of, of physical problems, it was just like that. They were bringing in these people. They were bringing in sometimes 50, 60, 70 year old people that they carried in. They were dying of diseases. And the beauty of it was all the Christians got there early. So the Christians got all the chairs. And when they started bringing in the Muslims, there was nowhere to put them. So they had to put them right up front. And they started, they had to bring in more chairs and they put them in the chairs and they put them on pallets and they just laid them on the floor. And the walkway down the aisle, see, we got plenty of room here. It wasn't like that. It was so crowded, I couldn't even hardly walk down the middle. People were sitting on the floors and whatever. It was amazing because I didn't really, uh, I didn't really have anybody to help me. And so I just started walking through and I just told them, I said, God's been waiting a long time for this night. He's been waiting to get here so that he could set you free. And we just started walking through the crowd and just started telling them they're free. And we started walking through, and as we walked through, you could it's I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it's, it's, it's an eerie, strange feeling when you're walking through a crowd and it is just wall-to-wall people, and you have to be careful where you step or you'll step on somebody's foot or hand or something because they're sitting there and you're trying to walk through and you see them passing a baby across their heads. And the baby comes to the middle aisle and then the people hand... I mean, I don't know if I would hand my baby across like that. But they did. I guess if you're desperate enough, you'll do anything. And they handed the baby across and when they got when the baby got to me, you know, I assumed something was wrong with it. But I got the baby. It was a beautiful little baby and I'm saying, I, I love children anyway, so I'm holding this baby and looking at it. And, you know, I don't... I didn't pray. I just stood there and held the baby. But I started noticing as I held the baby because it was wrapped in a blanket thing, this baby was hot. I mean, very, I mean, hot, fever hot. And so I just stood there for a few seconds and just held the baby and just kind of held it and didn't pray and didn't cry or anything at that point. Just held the baby and looking down, beautiful little baby. And then after a couple, maybe it wasn't even a minute, held the baby and then passed it back and they passed it back down the aisle. And whenever the baby got to the mother over halfway down the aisle, all of a sudden she screamed. And usually that means somebody's dead or somebody's alive. You know, somebody got healed, one of the two. <laughs> and so she yelled, and we, what's going on? Well, when the baby got back to her, all the fever was gone. She's completely healed. Amen? And so you walk through there and you just say, here, here you go. And See, it's not about getting all worked up. It's about resting. It's about just knowing, you know what? This word is true. God will not fail. He will touch your body. Now, the beauty of it is he didn't have to touch you. He's already decreed your healing. 
So he, he doesn't have to touch you. We don't have to convince God tonight to touch you. He's already decreed you to be free. Now, I will tell you this. Back in 1863, in America we had a civil war. <clears throat> and Abraham Lincoln, the president at the time, stood up and made his Emancipation Proclamation. And he said, all the slaves in the South are hereby free. He didn't free the slaves up North, just the slaves down South. Now, at the end of that war, a law was put in on the books that no person could own another person and that all men were created free and that all men were created equal. And so they had no right for slavery. Well, so technically... They had this, from then on, all the slaves were set free and they had the same rights as any other person. But do you know, they didn't realize those rights for a hundred years. It wasn't until 1963 that a man stood up and said, I have a dream that children of all colors will walk hand in hand together and you won't be judged by the color of your skin but you'll be judged by the intent of your heart and by what's in you. And now, even then it didn't stop. Matter of fact, he paid for that statement with his life. But he wasn't afraid to pay for it with his life because he knew somebody had to stand up and make a stand. Of course, his name was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Well, the amazing thing was that started what we know as the Civil Rights Movement. And it ended with freedom and total rights being established for all people. Now, you know, they, the slaves were free for a hundred years. It was already a law. They didn't add a new law. They just enforced the laws that were on the books. But you know what? They wouldn't have done it if somebody hadn't have got fed up. It took a hundred years. They were free for a hundred years. And yet, a hundred years after that, some people said, you know what, this ain't right. We got rights. And they started putting down their foot and saying, no more. We're not getting up and sitting at the back of the bus, no more. We're not giving up our place, no more. And by the end of it, they had their freedom. But nobody just gave it to them, even though it was a law. They had to get fed up and put their foot down. Now, that's how you got out of sin, if you got out of sin. At some point, you put your foot down and said, I'm done with it, never again. And you walk away from it. But you have to get fed up before you get out of it. Well, it's the same thing with sickness and disease. If you want, 2,000 years ago, Jesus bore the stripes. And by his stripes, you were healed. Now, 2,000 years later, and even back at that point, even after he bore the stripes, he put out his arms and said, it is finished. In other words, it's written in the books. It's a law. It's a fact. Your sins have been paid for. Your sickness has been paid for. So now it's time to live to God with righteousness, and it's time to live free of sickness and disease. So all you've got to do is decide. Put your foot down and say, no more. I'm done with sin, and I'm done with sickness. And if you do that, you don't even need anybody to touch you. You're free already. Yeah, you've been free. But once you make that decision, your chains fall off. Why? Because it's a law. So now, we know that two things. He bore our sins and our sicknesses. Now, go with me real quick to Matthew chapter 8. I'll prove it. Matthew 8. Verse 16 says, When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Healed all that were sick. Verse 17. Why? So that it might be fulfilled. He healed all that were sick so that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Now, 
That's the quote from Isaiah 53, 4. And basically, well, just 53, 4 is the way to say it. So, right there, he says that that word <clears throat> griefs and sorrows is sicknesses and infirmities. And you notice the way he fulfilled it was he had to heal all. Why? Because it was all in Isaiah 53 that was referred to. He bore our. Our is everybody. There's no sickness or disease he did not bear. Amen? Now, 1 Peter 2.24. This is real, real simple. This is just the legal grounds. That's all we're doing. We're just looking at the legal grounds for healing <clears throat> so that when we start ministering, we'll know why you're going to get healed. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were, past tense, healed. People say, well, now that ref that's not referring to sickness. That's referring to sin. He was saying, well, that's spiritual sickness. That's, and we were spiritually healed. Our, our spirits were healed. No, no, see, you have to understand. Your spirits weren't sick. Your spirits were dead. You didn't need spiritual healing. You needed resurrection. See, you can't heal something that's dead. You've got to raise it from the dead. So this is referring to sickness and disease specifically. Not only that, but it also, the very word used there for healed is a word that is only used for physical healing everywhere in the Bible, never for spiritual. So <clears throat> Jesus bore your sicknesses, and by his stripes you were healed. Now, <clears throat> last scripture, I'm not going to turn there, but if you wanted to, or you can write down the note, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 5, and the same thing is recorded in, Ma in uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 2, make sure it's right, <clears throat> that it said, what does it matter if I said, rise and be healed or your sins be forgiven? In other words, it doesn't matter. Why? Because they're both the result of sin, not, not a personal sin, but I'm talking about sin as a whole. And the cure is the same for both. Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus provided your cure. Now, as we begin to minister, all I'm going to ask is very simply, number one, <clears throat> as we minister to you when we get to you, if we start praying, please don't pray. Right? Let us pray. Now, <clears throat> or let us speak, or whatever we're going to do, let us do it. You don't do it, okay? You just be in neutral. So you don't have to do anything, just take it, okay? Now, we may not, again, we're not operating as doctors. We're probably not going to ask you a bunch of details or about your problem. We may say, what's the problem, what's the name? But we're not going to get into detail about your medical history because it, whatever you tell us isn't going to mean anything to us, right? Because we're not doctors, all we want to know is what's the name of this problem because that's what we're, going to, we're fixing to beat. Now, if you have several problems, you might say, well, it's several things. Or if you don't know the name, then don't worry about it. Just say it, they haven't diagnosed it. See, in what you're telling us, by what you tell us, we already know how to deal with it. And so as we begin to minister, all we're saying is just relax and let us do it. Amen? Jesus is going to work through the people that are ministering, and it's going to work. Now, as we minister to you, when we get done, we're probably going to tell you to do what you couldn't do before. So at that moment, you just begin trying to do what you couldn't do before. Jesus told the man with a withered arm, he said, stretch forth your arm, your hand. 
And the man could have said, are, are you stupid? Don't you see my arm is withered? I can't stretch it forth. Jesus told him to do something he couldn't do. And when the man attempted, he was healed. And so if we tell you to try to do something, then just try. Amen? Now, listen carefully. <clears throat> Jesus is the healer. We're the hands. We, we have good results. At the same time, we may have to pray twice. Right? Nothing wrong with that. Now, generally when I minister, I'm not even going to pray. Because Mark 16 says that believers lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So I probably won't even pray. I'll probably just touch you. May lay hands on your shoulder. You know, it, how I you know, do, it will be like that. A lot of times I might take you by the hand. But the key is, this isn't going to be a long, drawn-out thing where we go into this and fight back and forth over this thing and go, we're not going to do that. We're just going to touch you, say, be free, be healed, something along those lines. And then we'll probably say, now begin to do what you couldn't do before. It's going to be that simple. Why? Because the more we have to do, the more we have to get involved, and the less glory goes to Jesus. So we're trying to be as uninvolved as possible so that he can get more glory. Amen? You get that? So we're trying to keep this as pure as possible. Now, so let's pray. We'll pray first here. Probably pray a couple of times here right at the beginning. This will be the closest we come to what most people think is prayer for the sick. But we're going to pray first. And right now, in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you, we praise you, we bless you. Father, we thank you that tonight, tonight, we believe your word is true. We believe that by the stripes of Jesus, these people were healed. We believe that he bore their sickness and disease. So we believe that it is therefore a travesty of justice that Jesus would bear it and that they should bear it too. So since Jesus has already bore it, then we're going to demand that it leave them because it's not right that they bear it also. So Father, we thank you right now for their freedom, for their healing. And right now, in Jesus' name, Father, I give you praise. And right now, I turn my attention toward the sickness, the diseases, the pain, the ailments. And I say, in Jesus' name, you loose the people now. You leave them and never return. You have no right here. You did not pay for their body. You did not pay to abide in them. Jesus paid for their healing. So therefore, sickness, disease, pain, you will go. And you will go now. Leave them in Jesus' name. I set them free in the name of Jesus. Right now, pain, go in Jesus' name. Right now, every ailment, every hindrance to their physical healing, go now in Jesus' name. Leave them and never return. You have no right here and no place here. Now, in the name of Jesus, I set them free in Jesus' name. So be it. So be it. Right now. Now, let me ask you, how many of you have been through our healing training? See your hands. Get them up. Okay. Now, how many of you have been out doing it? Hands up. Those of you who have been out doing it. Okay. How many of you, it is working for you? You've been doing it. You're seeing results. Hands up. If, if that's true, I'm not just saying that. Okay. Now, then all these hands that are, that are up, now I want your body to follow it. <laughs> hands up, body's up. Let's go. Come on. This is why I train you. Now I want to get you to move right on up here in the front. Come on. Quick, quick. Right on up. Just line up across the front, face out toward the people. 
Now, here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> Not going to make you turn there, but there is a passage of Scripture which most of you, if you go to church at all, you would know. And it talks about how Jesus looked out and saw the people that had been following him for some time, and they were hungry. And the, his own disciples said, Lord, send the people away. They're hungry. And he said, no, you feed them. And then he had compassion on them. And they said, Lord, we can't feed them. We ain't got that much. And he said, well, bring me what you've got. And then whenever he got what they had, the little bit they had, he said, now here's what you do. You take the people and you make them sit down in groups of 50. Well, that's kind of where you're sitting, right? Maybe a little bigger than 50. But if you were to see the situation Jesus had, it would look kind of like this. People or, you know, organized and seated neatly together like this. So we can just kind of pretend that we're on that hillside and we're here and Jesus is here because he is. And now we're just going to move through the crowd. We're not going to ask you to come up. We're not going to ask you to do anything fancy. We're just going to move through the crowd. Now, if you need healing, then as we move toward you, when someone gets near you, I'm just going to ask you to put your hand up so they can see you. And then they're going to come to you. And we're going to work through. Amen? Now, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to come through. They're going to come through. Then I'm going to come through. And so we're going to be laying hands on people. We're going to be... Now, you, you want me to give you a secret? Remember I told you? That's why I told you this. Okay. <clears throat> I was wondering why I told you. I don't ever bring that testimony up. But remember I told you how the guy was standing behind the guy and had his hand on his back? And how it worked like electricity? Well, guess what? You know how hard it would be for me to go down every aisle in between here? It'd be hard. Why? Well, it's too thin, too hard to get over people. But you know what we can do? If you're in the middle somewhere and you need healing, you can put your hand up. And all you got to do is grab hands with everybody. I can walk down the end, grab the person on the end. And as long as you're not holding hands with the people next to you on the other side, it'll stop at you. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's the craziest thing. Well, good. Then we're in Bible lines right there. Because the Bible is some of the craziest stuff you'll ever read. Amen? And the neat thing about it is it works. Sometimes the crazier it is, the better it works. Right? And you explain that one. Okay? I think God just likes to show off. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to do. We're going to come down. We're going to touch people and just minister to people. Now, look. Nothing fancy. Nothing fancy. Amen? And we're going to Touch you, life's going to go into you, and then you begin to do what you couldn't do. Amen? Isn't that simple? Now, so we're going to go through it. Now, before we do this, let's do this. We're going to do two things. How many of you out here need healing? Let me see your hands. You need healing. Okay, yeah, that's what we figured. It's a good, good 90%. That's about average. Okay? Now, so you guys know that you got your work cut out for you, right? Okay? Now, we're going to try try to do this. We're going to try to go male to male and female to female, if we can do that. All right, now, it's not a hard and fast rule. It's just good to do it that way if you can. All right? Now, those of you that are going out, you know what to do. All you have to do is take them by the hand. You don't have to touch them. You don't have to do it. Just take them by the hand. You can shake their hand, and you can just touch their hand, and that's laying hands. And when you take them by the hand, you just tell them, in the name of Jesus, I set you free. That's all you got to say. Or in the name of Jesus, be healed. Or, you know, anything along those lines. Amen? Y'all got that, right? Y'all know how to do that. Now, so we're going to pray two ways now. First of all, those of you that are out there, I want you to pray with me. All right? So just repeat what I say after I say it. All right? If you need healing. All right? If you need healing. Just repeat this after me. But say it like you mean it. All right? Don't just whisper. No. Say it like you mean it. Put something into it. All right? Get serious. So just say this after me. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I believe that when my brother or my sister lays hands on me, I'm going to be healed. Tonight's my night. Came in sick, leaving well. Jesus paid for it. I'm getting it. Healing is mine. I'm leaving here well. When my brother or my sister lays hands on me, I'm going to be healed. 
This is the way it's going to be. Father, I thank you for it. I receive it now. And I give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name. Because by his stripes, I was healed. And if I was, I am. So thank you now that I'm healed. In Jesus' name. So be it. Amen. All right, now, amen. Now, matter of fact, if you wanted to, you could go ahead and start moving right now, and half of you probably already got free. So just check that out. Start moving. If pain's going, matter of fact, I'll do this real quick too. Pain in Jesus' name. I break your power. You're a liar. You will leave these people, and you will leave them now. You have no right here. Pain, tormenting pain, false pain. You will go now, now in Jesus' name. Now, you leave them and never return. Right now. Tormenting pain. Go now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now begin to move and even check for it. Look and see if there's any pain there. Any pain there. Now, if you've already been healed of pain or any kind of ailment like that, let me know. Wave your hand. Just let us know what's going on as we start to go through here. Now, those of you up here, here's what you're going to do, right? You pray with me also, right? Now, y'all don't have to pray. They're praying, all right? So say this, say this with me. Say, Father, Father I thank you. Tonight, I'm your hands. And tonight, I'm going to lay hands on the sick. And they're going to recover. Your life, your power, your spirit is going to go into them and set them free. Father, I thank you that I minister by grace. I don't do it based on how good I am. I do it. Based on how good Jesus is. And I thank you for it. And by his stripes, they were healed. And tonight, I'm enforcing that victory. And I'm setting them free. In Jesus' name. So be it. Amen. Now, those of you that are sick out there, raise your hand. Those of you up here, let's go. Move out amongst them. And just start ministering. Remember, quick and efficient. Quick and efficient. There's just too many people to spend a long time with. Just touch them. Command it to go. And move on. We'll get this started, and then I'll come out through there. I'm just getting them started. Make it quick and efficient. Let's go. Let's go. Straight through. Straight through. <clears throat> now I'm going to start coming through also. But I'm telling you right now, in Jesus' name, sickness and disease, you will go. You will go in Jesus' name. You cannot stay. You will leave them now in Jesus' name. Right now. Set them free. Set them free. Right now. Let's move on down. Move on in there. There you go. Right there. There's right there. Several right there together. <coughs> right there together. Begin to minister. There you go. Right on over. That's it. Now we're just going to go through. I'm going to turn off my microphone and begin to minister. Now I will tell you that once we move through, if you've been ministered to, begin to move and do what you couldn't do before. If you've been healed, let us know. And when you're ready to leave, you are free to go, basically. All right? So again, if you came for a show, you're not going to get that here. But if you... When you're ready to leave, you can leave. We're not going to you know, keep you here. So as far as I'm concerned, you are dismissed. Once you're ministered to, you can, can be, begin to move, and then you can go. So I'm going to turn off my mic and come through and start ministering to you now. Right? If you would, <clears throat> please stay where you are unless you are leaving, right? because we don't want to get you moving around in a bunch of commotion. So try to stay in your area if you would. Now, I will say thank you very much for coming. Those of you that have been to the seminar, we appreciate you. We'll begin to work with you. But I want to thank you, and we just want to praise God for what he's already done here this week, and we will see you again soon, actually November. So God bless you, and then we'll begin to, I will begin to come through and minister to you.